Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this fifth and last lecture on stress physiology. In this lecture, I'm going to focus, unlike the previous lectures that were dedicated to look at the mechanisms of stress and detailing where did glucocorticoids play a role, in this last lecture, I'm going to be focusing on what is it that we can actually do in terms of predicting or monitoring stress by using glucocorticoids. And this lecture will have two clear parts. The first one in which we will look or I will detail procedures or methods that can actually inform us on a stress situation with particular emphasis on non-invasive methods. And that's where this shows up. It turns out that in the feces and in other types of samples left over by animals, there is enough of a representation of actually different molecules present in the body, in this case glucocorticoids. So yes, feces, urine, have levels of glucocorticoids that presumably could indicate the level of stress. So in the first part of the lecture, I'm going to be talking how can we use these samples and uh, give you an example on how it's done. In particular, I want to emphasize this particular paper, this particular review paper published by Niels Polk and Washburn, in which the authors detail, give us some considerations that are important in order to use feces, fecal glucocorticoids, as, inter, as, as, in, as stress indicators, as in giving information about the stress status of the animal. Mm -hmm. Obviously, in this area, there has been a lot of progress, a lot of papers have been published, and the idea is that instead of using blood, instead of taking a blood sample to measure glucocorticoids, we can actually use other types of samples, most of the times samples that are discarded by animals in the form of hair, nails or antlers, feathers, blubber, feces, or urine. And this particular paper emphasizes the, uh, the use of feces. The analytical methods in all cases are available. Most of them are based on antibodies. But the problem is that they should not be applied indiscriminately. There is a need to validate methods and techniques before they are used to new species in field conditions that should be properly characterized. In particular, these two authors in their mini-review that I strongly encourage if any of you will end up doing these types of measurements, detail different validation and standardization procedures that are important. The authors basically talk about sampling pitfalls, so problems that arise in the obtaining of the sample, and in this case the age of the sample and the condition are important. Feces are obtained, but in which condition they are, how long have they been on place. Obviously, the best situation is that these, these samples are obtained recently, but there can be big variation, and this needs to be characterized. How the samples are stored and how they are transported, given that most of this is usually done in field conditions. The authors also detail, detail assay pitfalls, problems that arise during the assay. And of course, this has to do with subsampling procedures. If in this case we have to take a smaller sample to do the analytics, where are we obtaining the sample? In the surface, on the top, in the bottom, in the middle? This needs to be assessed. Mm -hmm. But also, as the efficiency of extraction, the glucocorticoids have to be extracted some from the samples, and efficiency have to be accounted for. Also, because most of these methods are based on antibodies, antibodies are known to have cross-specificity. Uh, is the antibody specific for glucocorticoids or a metabolite of it or another molecule? Can we use an antibody used against a given species in other species? These are all details that are important for the assay. And finally, biological pitfalls. If the sample has been obtained, do we know, do we have information about which individual has laid it, what's the age, the sex of this individual, the reproductive status, at what time of the day, analytic, uh, daily rhythms that could affect this. These are all important uh, aspects that need to be considered 
before the study is carried out. Once these things, these aspects are considered, methods can L or studies can be performed, and this actually is one example. In this study, the authors were interested in assessing the level or in assessing the effect of social stress. Social stress is in male baboons in particular, this species here increases the concentration of the glucocorticoids, as it does in many other species, this is well known. And what the authors were interested here in studying the correlation of rank shifts with glucocorticoid levels. And how they did this, essentially they implemented in a known population of baboons that uh, have been studied for a while in Botswana, what the authors did is that they changed group composition in order to create either a stable group environment in which animals are acquainted with each other and live with each other and have done that for a while, or animals were moved between different social groups, creating a social instability. And then the measurements of glucocorticoids from the feces were done by radio immunosensors. The essential results from this paper show that in stable social conditions, it's the lowly ranked individuals, the ones that have higher glucose concent uh, glucocorticoid concentrations. But in unstable group environments, in unstable groups, it's the highly ranked males, the ones that have higher levels. Notice, as expected, that in unstable conditions, the glucocorticoid levels for both groups are actually increasing. Moving on, after this first part, I want to now take another discussion. And this discussion has to do with how general, how can we generalize the existence or the increase in glucocorticoid levels or different parameters related with it, with chronic stress. And this is what these authors, Dickens and Romero, have done in a particularly nice meta-analysis article. A meta-analysis is a study based on other studies. So what the authors have done is collect studies that have looked at the glucocorticoid stress response in chronic situations, in chronic stress situations, and have analyzed them against each other. This particular study has considered different types of stressors, and the authors have also ranked them from minimally relevant and in this case, minimally relevant means that the stressor is poorly relevant in wild conditions to more relevant wild conditions. I'm going to detail or at least mention the ones, the procedures that are more relevant for wild conditions. And among the most relevant, ranked with the number five, basically you have temperature changes only for ectotherms, not endotherms. Novel environments, the presence of animals in novel environments, the predator or the absence of predators, food availability, starvation, or social stress, social instability. These are the types of stressors that the authors considered most relevant. Slightly less relevant would be procedures of isolation, restraint or handling, noise stress, crowding, density, transport in association with crowding, or putting together different stressors, anthropogenic stressors, the presence, the human presence, and finally, the exposure to predator odors. So what the authors have done is look at a range of studies in multiple species with different stressor models and have tried, have tried to find a general response in relation with glucocorticoids, or try to find if actually this general response is as we would expect so clear and remarkable. The variables that the authors have considered are changes in body mass, baseline glucocorticoid levels, stress-induced glucocorticoid levels, negative feedback of the glucocorticoid axis, time-integrated glucocorticoid responses, either measured in different types of samples, and finally, the sensitivity of the HPA axis by using ACTH injections. They have looked at all these variables. And they summarize their results in these type of graphs that I need to explain first. In particular, this is the graph that they obtain for baseline glucocorticoid levels. So, many different studies looking at baseline glucocorticoid levels using different types of stressors. We have one result for 
studies that use food availability, or lack of it, lack of food, predator presence, social stability, density, uh, variable stressors, restraint or captivity. And in all cases, the authors, that based on the studies, give us a range of levels of baseline glucocorticoid levels associated with the stressor. This range goes between no changes, a value of 2, to a decrease, which would be a value of 1, to an increase, which is a value of 3. And what you can see here is that while there are some stressors that seem to give a consistent response, some others don't. For example, food availability gives us a consistent response, although there is a big variation in between close to 0, I, sorry, close to 2 or closer to 3, the general picture is that food availability actually gives an increased concentration or lack of food, food as a stressor, gives an increase in baseline glucocorticoid concentrations. If instead we look at another stressor, like the presence of predators, you see that the response is so variable that we can hardly draw any conclusion. In some studies with some species, the presence of the predator decreases glucocorticoid levels, while in others it increases glucocorticoid levels. Nevertheless, it's clear that depending on the stressor, the response varies. If we look at the stress-induced glucocorticoids, now the pattern is extremely much more variable. Notice that all the lines basically stretch closer to 1 to closer to 3, meaning that there is a lot of variation between the studies. In some studies, the levels of glucocorticoids after the stress decrease, in some others increase. What can we make out of it? Is there a general pattern? Well, from this picture, apparently not. What the most general pattern that the authors find, albeit with, in, with relatively smaller studies, is actually in body weight. Consistently, with four different types of stressors, in all cases, chronic stress in different species leads to a decrease in body weight. And I bring now back the argument that Hans Selye already came up with back in the 1940s, and as I reviewed in a previous lecture. The point is that body weight actually is well representative of a chronic stress situation. What the authors conclude from their study is what the title says, that a consensus endocrine profile for chronically stressed wild animals does not exist. So although it's clear that glucocorticoids are released in a stress situation. In a chronic stress situation, not all individuals, not with not all, not all species, with not all chronic stress models, actually give a consistent or a predictable endocrine response. And this is an important message that we need to take into consideration. This is actually the abstract from this. Uh, this paper, for, just for your reading, it will give you a complete picture. And that's the end of this lecture. It's now time for questions. Thank you for listening.